Okay. Welcome everyone to Homeschooling 101, a guide for K-5 parents. My name is Tracy Cummings McGreal. I'm the administrator for the ADP Center here at Montclair State University. And I'm joined today by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Fernando Nadich. He's an associate professor here at Montclair State in the teaching and learning department where he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses. Um, he specializes in bilingual and multicultural education, critical pedagogy, and culturally and linguistically responsive teaching. He has more than 20 years teaching experience on four different continents. He also provides training and professional development to several school districts in our surrounding area and he directs the Montclair State University Network for Educational Renewal. Welcome Dr. Nadich. Um, so first I just wanted to welcome everyone and let you know that the session today is going to be recorded. So if you need to reference it later, it'll be available to you or you can send it to a friend or colleague. Um, we're also going to be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So you can either text your question into the chat. If you look at the bottom of the screen where the chat function is, you can put your questions into the chat and either um, Joe, the director of the ADP Center will answer them or he'll field the questions to myself or Dr. Nadich or you can save them for the end. Either way, it's all good. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see it yet? Okay, here we go. Uh, Tracy, before you get started, um, I just wanted to introduce Karen Hackett, uh, oh, the Associate you. Director of <laughs> Alumni Engagement at Montclair State University. <laughs> Sorry, Thanks, Karen, Joe. I was getting there. <laughs> no worries, Tracy. Thanks, Joe. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Hackett, as just said, Associate Director of Alumni Engagement. It's a pleasure to welcome you. Um, you know, it's wonderful to have a lot of friends with us. I want to note that you play an important role in our future. There are so many ways you can be involved on campus. You can mentor a student, you can speak in a class, um, or you can attend an event to build your networks. And I also want to thank you uh, for your support, uh, especially during this challenging time. Recently, uh, we participated in Giving Tuesday Now, and you helped us raise nearly $20,000 for two important initiatives, and those were the Student Emergency Fund in the mix lab, which produced PPE masks for frontline healthcare workers locally. So again, we're so grateful for the continued support. Uh, and folks, if you haven't already, please join the new online platform, Monk Connect. Uh, it will allow you to uh, mentor a student. Uh, there are volunteer opportunities also available, and it's a way to connect with fellow alumni. Uh, a network of that's 130 thousand so you can learn about the benefits available to you uh, be sure to log on when you get that invitation and check our weekly uh, email on Mondays for upcoming events including performances lectures webinars etc so again thanks for being with us and with that I'll turn it over to Tracy thanks Karen I appreciate it okay so let's get started so we're here to provide you with this workshop um, so that you can have some tech resources um, hopefully some fun things for your kids we'll talk about wellness and um, hopefully some tips to make it all work. So let's get to the next slide. Okay, first things first. <laughs> we all know that this is a really challenging time um, just with everything going on and homeschooling is indeed a challenge and a stressor for all of us. I know for myself, um, homeschooling is <laughs> at the top of that list. I really feel for all of you parents that have um, more than like, you know, one or two kids under the age of 10 because that makes it extra challenging. So um, just try to be patient with yourself. Um, we all need to give ourselves a break. I love this uh, quote, you can't pour from an empty cup. So take care of yourself first. We'll try to have a little fun with this. So some words to the wise, strive for progress, not perfection. Um, 
First thing, I think it's important to keep in touch frequently with your child's teacher. Definitely let them know what's going on, not just with your child, but also what's going on in your family. You might be a first responder or, you know, you and your husband or your, your partner might be working from home and it might be very difficult for you to help your child um, with their homeschooling during the day. I mean, after working and then having to sit with your child to finish their homework, it's, it's very draining. So ask the teacher, say, What's the most important thing for my child to, to complete? They'll, if you tell them and have a nice rapport with them, they'll be a lot more understanding. Uh, so, you know, you won't have to be bogged down with submitting like tons of um, worksheets or whatever they're requiring you to um, finish. The other thing I advise is create some type of group, um, whether it's Facebook Messenger or another avenue that you want to develop. Um, I happen to have a, a parent group where I can connect with all of the different parents from my child's grade. Um, and we were a resource for each other. Um, we're a sounding board for each other. If you live in a district and you don't have this, um, you can always contact the child's teacher or the principal and hopefully they can you know, send an email out so someone, they can devise a group so that you'll have some people to connect with and commiserate with and um, hopefully maybe set up some like virtual play dates for your kids so that they can be more connected as well. And the other thing is please do what works for your family. Um, everyone's very unique and different. We all have different situations. Um, I actually interviewed a bunch of teachers for this workshop, um, you know, to help me put it together and just have some points of reference. Uh, media arts teacher Heather Schimmel from Roseland said, teachers don't teach their own children. It's very difficult for parents. We want to hear from parents and we want to know when kids are struggling. So I thought that was really helpful um, because a lot of times the, the teachers assign the homework, but they don't know exactly what's going on. Dr. Nadich, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can start talking about the next slide already, which is basically my... <laughs> oh, I can go to that one. Okay, because I, I uh, as uh, Tracy said before, I have a lot of international experience and I have worked before in situations of either disaster or war in refugee camps. Most of my uh, professional life has been working with immigrants, English language learners, refugees. So I just had some uh, thoughts that I put together that I would like to share. That first of all, this is an unprecedented moment and nobody's doing this perfectly. This is not about doing it right. In fact, no expert can tell you what it means to do it right. I think we do what we can with the resources that we have. We try to do our best, right? And for that, I think it's very important to set some realistic expectations, meaning of course you want your kids to do the work but it's not about completing all the work, it's about how you negotiate the work to be done. And I know we're gonna be sharing today a lot of resources that are online. I just wanna to add to that uh, something about social media that uh, uh, one of the things that I've seen happening is that parents tend to compare themselves to what other parents are doing or what other families are doing. And I would like to ask you to stay away from that, right? Uh, for two reasons. First of all, you don't want to compare yourself to others because every family is in a unique situation, but also because people usually go to social media to boast about their lives. And in many cases, it's not the reality that they are experiencing. So it can be very actually daunting for you to see that, oh my God, but there are a lot of people are doing this and that, and I'm not doing half of it. The truth of the matter is uh, productivity is at a very, very low right now. I hear that from students, I hear that from parents who are working. Uh, it has affected the way that we go about doing our tasks. So your success is not measured by uh, how, by uh, you, it's basically what you got it done. It's not exactly how much you've accomplished, right? It's also important to remember that not everything right now needs to be academic, right? There are other things that are beneficial to kids. Kids need to learn to help you know, at home with chores, cleaning, making dinner, engage them in other activities that are not only academic. That's extremely important. Uh, that, that first bullet that says about the, the micromanaging kids, in situations like that, when people live you know, under close quarters all the time, parents tend to become helicopter parents. And this is something also that you have to try and stay away from because the research has shown that it actually gives kids a sense of defeat 
meaning they cannot accomplish by themselves. So they need the parent to manage their lives. And this is a very important moment for you to develop what we call parenting for the long term, meaning that you are going to use that as an opportunity to uh, engage in communication with the kids. With the kids, one of the ideas that I have seen uh, being done successfully is to have a family meeting. So you can have it once a week where you sit down and you discuss what's going on, what's our chores, how much you know have we accomplished, what can we do differently. This is the moment to actually uh, engage in this kind of building relationships at a different level with your kids. And this is why I also like the idea of taking turns with your responsibilities, right? So depending on how many people are in your house, you can say, you know, while you focus on the cooking, I'm gonna take over and I'm gonna do something else. And this is extremely important that everybody has some responsibility and everybody makes everybody else accountable. Okay, so let's get started with some tips and technology resources. So for kindergarten and first grade, it's, it's very interesting. Our kids are learning basic reading, writing, and math. Um, I interviewed a veteran kindergarten teacher from Pompton Lakes, Liz Catcher. She said the most important thing that she wants her students to leave kindergarten is having learned independence and to be comfortable making decisions and mistakes, not reading chapter books, not doing a addition problem. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Give yourself a break if you're, you know, your five-year-old is not able to sit there um, and work on some homework sheets or, you know, look, you know, read a book or something. Um, another thing is make sure you give your kids an ample breaks. I think we all need to take ample breaks, adults and, and kids alike. Um, the adult attention span is only 20 minutes. So therefore, we can't expect our kids to even sit there for 20 minutes. So um, one good way for kids to take a break, a lot of districts use this. It's called Go Noodle. You can look it up on the web. Um, it's a free uh, app and website. And it's basically an app that has all different types of exercises. So they can get up from their chair and do yoga. They can um, NFL play 60. They have like different NFL and baseball and basketball players that are doing like a little dance or some kind of movement activity that they can do. Um, it's very beneficial for, for, for everyone to take these breaks. And I think what they do in, um, in school in the younger grades is they don't just sit there and do these activities. They move from one activity to the other and they do take these breaks. So it's important to keep that in mind. Another thing I like uh, for this age group is Pinterest. You can look up choice boards. These are little boards that you can print out that have different uh, activities on them for kids. Like one might be like, you know, count 10 pennies for this age group. They ha I, I think this is probably appropriate for like K to three. Um, but, you know, even teachers will use this where they, they get to independently make a choice on what they want to work on. And um, the other thing too is it's not always something computer oriented. So you get to give them a little bit of a break that way. Um, research shows that at this age, experiences are better than technology. Um, but at the same rate, you still need to give yourself a break. If you, um, are, you, you, you're on a meeting or you have work to do and you're, you need an hour and you, you leave your kid on a device for an hour, it's fine, you have to you know, cut yourself a break. Um, another thing that I wanted to touch on was what Dr. Nadich men mentioned before about um, kids fostering independence. You can start this in like a very basic way. I remember when my five-year-old was um, a little too reliant on me, I started telling her, well, when you wake up in the morning, you're gonna get your own cereal. So I put the bowls um, on the counter and the cereal and um, I put the milk in a pitcher because the milk was too heavy for her and I put it on a lower shelf in the refrigerator and she'd get up in the morning, get her bowl, her cereal, her spoon from the drawer and she'd get her own cereal. And fostering that independence um, also helps kids create confidence and that's something that we want our kids to develop. Um, one of my favorite things is to use a timer. This is helpful in a lot of different ways. Kids at this age aren't very self-directed. Um, it also helps them to develop the skill of pacing, which is a very helpful skill. 
Um, and you can direct kids to, you put the timer on, they read for 20 minutes, and then they're on to the next thing. But the greatest thing about the timer is you're never the bad guy. Um, when you put the timer on for 20 minutes or a half an hour and their device time is over, you can say, well, the timer went off. It's not your fault. I didn't think it would work when someone told me that, but it actually works beautifully. So now to get into our tech resources, um, Teacher Monster to Read. I'm going to talk about that as one of, one of my favorites. That's in the next slide, Scratch Junior. That is a, a first coding app. Um, it's for... Um, kids, I think ages five to seven, and they're able to create their own interactive stories and games. They snap together uh, graphical programming blocks, and they're able to do all these different things. So um, I think it's really good for them. I mean, Scratch was developed by MIT. It's a great program for kids to start to learn coding. Um, and a lot of these different uh, applications are scalable, meaning that some of them are scalable up and some are scalable down, and I'll be discussing that. Uh, the other two reading apps I wanna mention are Epic and Books. They're all free now during lockdown. Um, those are websites that have uh, all your kids and your favorite books from when you were a kid, storybooks and chapter books. You can go on there and um, they have a read aloud function where the, the story will be read to your child. So if you're, you know, you're doing your work, and your kindergartner needs to read, they can actually use this read aloud function on these websites. Uh, and the other great thing is they're actually read like, it doesn't sound like a robot, it's actually pretty nice. Um, the other one I wanted to mention is Literati. Literati is an actual mail order subscription book. So what they do is they'll send you like five books that they think your kid might like you get to peruse them and then send back the ones you don't want. And the prices are comparable with Amazon. So if you feel better with having your child have an actual book in their hand and taking that tech break, you can do that too. But the great thing is if you don't really like any of the books or your child doesn't love them, you can just send them right back, which is nice. And that's all free. You don't have to pay for shipping for and back. So that's something nice. Okay. Before we go on to the next slide, I just- Sorry, Fernando. No, I just wanted to add something because you talked about uh, uh, in your tips there about the uh, timers and breaks, and it goes back to what we were saying before about uh, accountability and communication. One of the questions we get a lot is how much screen time is too much? And I think one of the things that we have to allow ourselves to understand in a situation like that is that screen time right now is not the danger, right? The danger actually lies outside with the virus. So if kids find pleasure in using technology and in sitting in front of a screen, that's not going to be problematic, right? As long as you create some accountability. So you do have to have tasks and create limits for those tasks. And uh, it can even give you, while the kids are using technology, gives the parents some time to actually re-energize their own batteries. Uh, one of the things that I suggest is something that we call the do before you're done list. And parents can do that with the kids, which is basically create a list every day or every week of the things that need to be accomplished and make kids understand that need precedes want. So they have to accomplish those tasks. If they check all of those tasks, they are allowed, it's kind of a, an award or reward system, that they are allowed to go and spend an X amount of time in technology in something that they enjoy without being necessarily academic. All right, so my favorite K to First website is Teacher Monster to Read. And what's great about this website, this is a scalable um, application that is scalable down. So it's also available if you have children in preschool. Um, it's a game that helps children to read. It's, it's basically a, a, a game. Um, it can be competitive between siblings or friends. Um, it's available on laptop, computer, iPad, Android and Kindle. Um, it's free on the computer, but if you do decide to get the app, it's $2.99. And kids just love it. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I've heard a lot of families that love this app and, and use it. Okay, so whoops, let's get into second and third grade. Um, does your child need quiet background noise or complete quiet? I think this is interesting. Um, sometimes these little nuanced things um, can make a difference for your child. 
Um, I'm sure if you have more than one child, you in school, you are trying to create some kind of a staggered schedule. Um, and another thing is have older kids help younger kids because it creates responsibility and empathy. It also gives you a break and you know, you can always thank your kid, get them a little something or actually spend some time with them. Then it's really nice that that you know that would be really nice. Um, Laura Healy, she's a media specialist from Wayne. She says, when is your child's most productive time? It might not be first thing in the morning. And I thought about what she said, like your child might need to log on to their Google Meet in the morning for an hour and then take a break and then eat their breakfast and gather themselves together before they start their work. I know a lot of times we want our children to, um, you know, get started in the morning, you know, work completely through to lunch and then they're done. And then it's kind of like you can take a sigh of relief, but that might not necessarily be what works, what works for them. Um, so some of the, the, the tips, the, the tech resources I wanted to highlight, Brain Pop Junior, that's, uh, I think that's K to, K to four, I think. That's one of the scalable apps. This is the scaled down version. It's for all of the subjects. Um, and the three in the middle, MobyMax, Seesaw, and Kahoot, these are used by many districts. Maybe your district uses one of these. Um, but I think what's interesting about these is, you know what, my children liked some of these. They've used multiple um, of, of these different apps. And some of them they like better than others. So you could use this to, since they're all free right now, you can see which one works best for you. Um, Another one that I really love is Mystery Science. Uh, if, if you have any kids that are science buffs, they can go on and choose, like they have little mini videos and lessons. And I think what's great about them is uh, it, asks, it answers all the questions your kids have, like, you know, why, is it, why can a chameleon change colors? Or, you know, why is the sky blue? There's lots of different questions that will, your kids can answer and they're all like eight, laid out for age appropriate level. So it's, it's a really nice website for kids to just explore and, and have fun, like finding out some interesting tidbits. Fernando? Yeah, I, I loved everything you said. I like the idea of having the siblings helping each other and even getting help from your classmates by contacting them through uh, the online resources that you have. One thing to remember uh, that's important to remember is for you not to do the work for your child. This is a, a great moment to give kids agency. They need to take responsibility. That's why I like the idea of having to plan. You can plan the week or you can plan every day, whichever is easier. But understand that you've already been in third and fourth and fifth grade, so it's their turn to do the work now. Going back to the idea of giving them agency and once you establish that there are tasks to be accomplished, trust them, give them agency so they can actually uh, learn to search for the help that they need. I love that. I think that's a great point. Okay, so my favorite for second and third grade is Brain Pop Junior. Um, it's a very colorful interface. It has videos, games, quizzes, and activities for all different subjects. And I think what's interesting about this one is it not only just has the subjects, but it also has health, it has technology and music. Um, it's free during the lockdown. Uh, and they just have some cool lessons. Like I was just looking at it before, and if you're a music person, you can you know learn about Yo-Yo Ma. Um, you can learn about Louis Armstrong. Like I, I like that they have a jazz component and uh, you know, they have cool art lessons. Like I saw one on Frida Kahlo and it's definitely a kid favorite. My kids really liked uh, Brain Pop Jr. So I'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so fourth and fifth grade. Um, as Dr. Nadich was saying before, this is a really great age for kids to collaborate on homework. Um, my daughter, my youngest daughter is currently in fifth grade. After she has her Google Meet in the morning with her teacher, she collaborates you know, with writing with um, some of her classmates or friends. They could join on a Messenger Kids or a FaceTime or a Google Meet. And this is actually what you know, professors assign in college. Like they have students meet in a group or they'll have a discussion post where people are sharing their ideas. This is another form of learning. Um, and not only 
does that take place, but they're also having that social connection that they might be missing. Um, I think that's really helpful for them. And it's helpful for you too. So you don't have to sit with them. Sometimes they can sit there and figure out a math problem together. So that's uh, really helpful, I think, for this age. Um, as our kids get older, observe how they work best. And this is kind of what I was saying before. Um, as I said, like you might want your kid to have everything done by 12 and some kids may do that. They might be great and just be able to bang it out and get it done by lunchtime. But my daughter actually is not like that. She uh, likes to take many breaks, but that's what works for her. And I'm, I let her use this opportunity to do it how it works best for her. Um, the other thing too is our kids may be more independent at this age, but at the same rate, I think they require a lot more emotional support. Um, so before I turn it over to Fernando, I just wanted to talk about uh, the tech resources. One of my favorite is Science Mom. Um, it's a mom, she's a scientist and she just started doing this um, a YouTube channel with her kids and she uh, recruited her husband who is known as Math Dad, <laughs> which is great and they have, um, you know, competitions and they have all different kind of cool science experiments. And they've also had a live stream called a quarantine, which is kind of cute. Um, so that's something cool for the kids to look at. Um, quizzes, I'm going to talk about in the next in the next slide brain pop. This is the upscaled version for four, four and five, which is helpful. Um, another one that I want to mention is Flipgrid. Now, Flipgrid is free. You can download it to your um, device or you could um, go on the website. What's great about Flipgrid is you, you use it to take a video of yourself. So your child can take a video of themselves. And if they're a younger student, they can um, retell a story. So it helps with reading comprehension. You can use it to send little videos to each other. So you're keeping in touch with your kids throughout the day if you're busy, like working on something in your office or even if you, you know, you work outside the home and you can't be with them. Um, another thing too is Flipgrid is great because the best way to learn is to teach somebody else what you already know. So if your child just learned something um, in math or um, in science, they can kind of tell you, you know, what is an atom or what is, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> whatever we do in science at that age. But it's just a great tool, I think, to use. Um, Dr. Nadich. One of the things that we have noticed is that the parents' frustration is at a high right now, too. And uh, I guess because now parents are becoming also educators, they realize that uh, schools and schooling has evolved. And uh, kids don't necessarily, uh, uh, even the math problems, they don't actually tackle a problem the same way that the parents used to do. I'm currently working with, uh, with a number of school districts, but in one of the school districts, we had this issue with math because uh, many of you uh, might be familiar with a program called Envisions, which is a very popular math program that's being adopted across school districts in New Jersey. And they are very particular in the way that kids are supposed to solve a problem. And the parents were having actually a hard time doing the problem the way that they were expected to. So what we decided to do, and I think it's very important, it's to forget about standards right now. When kids go back to school, they will go back to the standards. This is a time that you have to fulfill a task. You have something in front of you. So forget about this is the right way to do it, right? So uh, you have there that photo math, which is an app that I actually suggested that school districts use, that it basically you take a picture of the math problem and it helps you sort through the problem different ways. And I think this is what we should be focusing on right now, forgetting about standards and just, okay, we have something to do it. It's okay to do it different ways and not necessarily the way that the program that's being used by the district requires. Don't try to do that because you might actually end up making it even worse for kids. Uh, one of the things that the research has shown is that a lot of parents are transferring their own frustrations with their own work situations, which hasn't been easy for anybody, but they, they end up transferring that onto their kids because they can solve sometimes their own problems. They transfer that to the kids that are already suffering from the lack of being at school. 
And that makes the situation even worse. There are different ways of, of doing things and you need to be very, very flexible right now. Oh, there we go. Okay, so my favorite websites for fourth and fifth grade. Epic, as I mentioned before, and that's because it's such a great, um, it's a great website with books and definitely for older kids with chapter books and things that are um, age appropriate. But what's great about Epic is they also have books in Spanish, um, whether for native speakers or just to have your kids like, you know, practice their Spanish by reading like, a, you know, a story, a Spanish storybook. Um, and as I said, it's, it's got that great read aloud function that's not robotic. So it, it has like a really nice sound and it has some cool how-to videos on it. Quizzes, my daughter actually currently uses this in fifth grade and it's basically gamified quizzes. Now, I wouldn't think that would be fun personally, but she, <laughs> obviously the kids like it. So basically they can either choose from hundreds of quizzes or they can create their own. And I think that's helpful. And I think the reason why the teacher assigns that is because they're formulating this quiz, they're going back into the text, looking things up. So that's solidifying some of that knowledge um, in there. Dr. Nadich, did you have anything for this slide? I can't remember. No. Okay. I, I wanted to talk a little bit later, but we can talk about later about the, um, the, 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 the libraries. Okay, yeah, we could talk about that. You just let me know when you want to chime in. So. I would be remiss if I did not chat about special subjects. I'm sure most of the districts are still assigning um, work <laughs> for special subjects. Um, I think of them more as an outlet than a necessity to complete um, like a, a music assignment, especially in K to five. But I definitely love um, GarageBand and Tenuto. Unfortunately, they're only available on iOS. But what I love about Tenuto is a lot of our kids are learning to play instruments in fourth and fifth grade. Um, Tenuto is an app that helps your children learn and recognize notes on the music staff. So it will play a note like an A and you'll child will have to look on the bar and say, okay, I, I know that that's an A and they can, you know, click on it to like at least get it right. And they'll be able to learn how to read music much better by using this. It's really a great app. Um, languages. I love Duolingo. I use it all the time. I went to Portugal last year and uh, I learned to speak a little bit of Portuguese by using Duolingo. Um, so it has many languages, not just Spanish and Portuguese and other languages like that. It has that many, um, many languages that are not very common, like Navajo or um, Gaelic. Um, you could even learn Klingon if you're a Star Trek fan. Um, but the other thing I love about Duolingo is it not just, it, it's also for native Spanish speakers. So you can, in Spanish, you can learn how to speak Mandarin, which I think is uh, pretty cool. Um, for art, I love Prisma. That's just an app that you can download on either uh, iOS or Android and basically kids can take a picture and then turn it into a work of art by using some of their filters like Mondrian um, or some other cool artists. Um, and the other one I really like is uh, Art for Kids Hub. That's a family that draws and uh, you could subscribe to their YouTube channel and basically uh, the, they use rudimentary shapes and formulate it into a drawing. So your kids are learning the basics of how to draw. Anyone can be an artist. I think it's good for kids to know that. Um, it's a great form of self-expression and uh, it's a great website for kids to learn how to draw. Dr. Nadich? Yeah, just want to add, of course, I, language is just really up my alley. And I've been working with the foreign language and ESL teachers because that's basically my work. And I also love Duolingo. When I lived in the Middle East, I learned Arabic. So now I'm actually brushing it up. But I actually, uh, one of the issues that students are having is that languages need to be practiced and kids need to engage in communication. This is why we have the Rosetta Stone right there because Rosetta Stone has, they have several promotions going on, but one of them is what they call the live group coaching. So kids can get in small groups and there will be a coach from Rosetta Stone that is going to practice the language with them. And that is free until the end of June. So take advantage of that. And you can use technology to get just like we're doing right now to get kids together. That's very important that they actually get to not only to learn, but to practice the language. So check it out. 
Okay, now we get to my favorite part, parent tech helpers. Um, for all of you parents, uh, definitely for my generation, like I had to get up to speed on all these different applications. Um, so hopefully these will help you navigate the landscape for your child's homeschooling. Um, one of my favorite programs is Otter. Um, it's a free app, 600, you can uh, use it for 600 minutes. And what it is, is it converts live speaking into a written transcription. So um, if your child is on their Google Meet and you, you don't wanna miss what the teacher says, you can use your phone and press record and it'll actually transcribe in real time exactly what the teacher is saying. It's pretty stellar in terms of the transcription. I mean, it's not perfect if, if the teacher is saying a proper name or place, or there's two people um, chatting at the same time, it might not be able to translate it properly. What, but what's great about the transcription is that there's a, the audio recording is retained with it. So if you get to a part and you're not sure what they said, you can highlight on the word, the highlight the words, and it'll play back exactly where they were in the conversation so you can figure out what they were saying. Um, another thing that Otter is great for is for little kids. So since children like K to three don't write particularly fast and they're getting their thoughts out for their writing, they can use Otter, speak their thoughts in, and it will transcribe it for them so they can go back later so they can put together whatever they wanted to do for their writing. I think it's great for that. It's also good for kids that have dyslexia um, since it's hard for them to, to write. Um, it really helps for them. So I also wanted to talk about Chrome extensions. So we'll be, I'll show you how to use them in the next slide, but when we're using Chrome for our Google Meets and whatnot, sometimes um, there are certain things that will help that are helpers. So one of them is Screencastify. That's a screen recorder uh, for Chrome and it records video and audio. The only caveat is, is that um, it only will, rec the free version only records for five minutes. So um, if you just wanted to catch something quick, you can use that. Your kid can just click on it and record it for you or for themselves so they don't forget what they need to do. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'll show you how to use that in the next frame. The other one that I really love is Kami. And what Kami is, is um, an extension that helps kids, if they, let's say the, the teacher assigns a math sheet and it's a PDF, you can use Kami to annotate directly on there so you don't have to print it out and then take a picture of it and then send it back to your child's teacher. You can annotate right on the screen so your child can do the, the math right on the screen and then you can just sub turn it in. It has its own turn in function. Um, even my daughter in high school loves this app because who wants to print it out and then have to do all that work to turn it back in. The other thing is Google Meets extension grids. If your children are on a Google Meet, they cannot see all, the, all of their classmates. So by downloading this uh, extension, they can see all of the kids in their class. And I'll show you how to do this on the next screen. So when you go to the Chrome Web Store, you type it in here on the space bar, you'll type in the extension you'd like to use. So I typed Kami in here. So all you need to do is go over to the Add to Chrome. And what'll happen is it'll appear up here next to the space bar. I haven't added Kami yet in this frame, but you could see here is the, the Google Meet extension grid and this is the Screencastify. So should I wanna use this, or my child wants to use this, they just need to click on the button and they'll be good to go. So I thought that would be really helpful. Um, so let's move on to cool co-curricular ideas for K to fivers. My, one of my favorites is these Explore Animal Cams. They're live cams from all over the world. Um, Karen was saying that her daughter was looking at a giraffe cam. Um, my, I love birds, so I've been like watching uh, a hummingbird cam, and it's great because I saw the, the eggs laid, I saw them hatch out of the egg, and I just saw the two of them fled yesterday so and fly away. It was very sweet. So your kids can go on if they need a 10-minute break. They can watch manatees. They have like other animals like cats and dogs, but it's just a lot of, it's a lot of fun. Um, park it. Um, that's a great app for the national parks. So they can do, some of them have aerial 
uh, tours and other types of cool things for kids to explore our national parks. Um, if you have any kids that are geography buffs or have an interest in that, I highly recommend Stack the States and Stack the Countries. Um, they are $2.99, they're not free, but what's great about these apps is they're really fun to play and your kids can learn every state, every capital, every country, um, the flag, the native language that they speak, uh, famous landmarks. I mean, it's, it's a really good thing to know. Um, but if your kids, if, if you don't wanna download the app, there's like not exactly the same, but a similar version on cool math games. If you go to the, the more tab, you can download or play um, Map Snap, which is a really hardcore version of, um, you have to take the country and snap it into the, the continent that it is. So I started out, I think with South America, it's only 13 countries. It wasn't as hard, but it's still hard, but it's definitely good to know. Um, Google Earth is great so that they can explore either their neighborhood or, you know, they can explore um, Thailand or, or Paris. Um, wide Open School is great. Um, wide Open School, I think, is part of Common Sense Media, and they have a lot of great virtual field trips. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen all the live zoo feeds on Facebook. Cincinnati Zoo is one of my favorites. They have a resident cheetah and dog that are best friends. And they also have um, a really cute, like, uh, adolescent hippo who's super cute, Fiona. So you could probably not just connect with them, but also like some other cool zoos. Another thing I recommend are scavenger hunts. You could get lots of ideas from Pinterest. But I think what's like, especially when your kids are really little, I find it, I did this with my kids when they were little, and I found it to be very helpful. I would just take 10 of their action figures and go hide them in a room or in a couple of rooms and say, okay, I took your 10 favorite action figures, go find them. And that might give you like 20 minutes or so, so that you can, you know, go on a call or take a few minutes for yourself, drink your coffee or whatever you need to do. And it gives them something to do not on a screen. Uh, or, you know, maybe you don't have a, enough devices in your house, so you need to give them something to do so you can use the device and, uh, connect with work. Chris, um, I think you, you mentioned before uh, the common sense media. Yeah. I just want to jump in uh, because mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of resources here and sometimes parents get a little overwhelmed. So I'm going to actually be a little biased, but I'm going to suggest that if you have to focus on one, uh, please do check the Open Wide School website. It is actually it was put together by common sense media, which means that it's safe both in terms of the content that your child is going to be exposed to and in terms of technology. What I particularly like, you know, I'm in the College of Education and Human Services, so I've been working a lot with the pre and in-service teachers, and a lot of them have been using this particular website. It's just everything together, wideopenschool.org. There is a lot of content. They have a lot of partners, and it's a great interface, which is very user-friendly. When you go to the website, you can choose, I'm an educator, I'm a parent. There's a, a a plethora of resources there and uh, they are excellent and as I said before it's safe because the content is basically has been previously analyzed so it's suitable it's divided by grade levels it's pre-k to five and then uh, grades six to eleven to twelve so I if you feel like overwhelmed and there's a lot of resources I suggest you check that one out Okay, so now we'll get into the family well, uh, wellness section. Um, I, I love this technique, HALT. It's used by therapists, and not only is it helpful in uh, gauging yourself, but it's, I definitely think it's great when dealing with your kids. A lot of times, sometimes, you know, when we're at home, we're all together in a confined space, especially when the weather's bad. Um, but when your children are acting up, like I generally tend to remind myself with my kids, are they hungry? Are they angry or frustrated? Are they lonely or are they tired? Because when, whenever any of us are any of these things, we're not going to, we're not going to react properly. We're, um, we're not putting our best foot forward. So not only do we have to think of them, but also ourselves when we're reacting. Um, teacher Tony Ann Klaus from Oakland says, remember to put it all in perspective. Our kids aren't difficult in school. 
they tend to save it all for us. And this is a difficult time for them too. So sometimes we might just want to take a step back uh, and think about and think about things like this because this isn't a very easy time. Dr. Nadich? Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, one of the things, uh, you can go to the next slide, I think, okay. uh, where I put my list. Yes. Uh, one of the things that, uh, before I start with the list, uh, depending on how many children you have at home, one of the things we know that the research has shown, it's important to find one-on-one uh, -on -one time with every child. So one of the suggestions would be to have face-to-face, -face, like, you know, conversations with your child individually. This is very important. This is the time where they need to understand that uh, even though we are in a difficult situation, you still have time for each individual child. Kids are suffering because we are missing out on a lot. A lot of my, we have birthdays, graduation, athletic events, uh, class trips that are actually happen usually at this time of the year in schools. They have all been canceled. So there's a lot of disruption in their lives and there is change, right? And, and we forget that this can also be a traumatic experience for kids. So it's important that uh, we can use this moment as an opportunity to, to create new memories and also an opportunity to build resilience, which is actually a very important skill, resilience and dealing with adversity which is actually positive skills that we need for life in general. So how can we recreate all of those things that kids are missing out on? I'm sure you've seen on TV, they show all the time the creative ways that people are going over graduations, all those rituals, but you can also create your own. I'm sure you've seen on TV the father who created you know, a graduation ceremony for his daughter in, in, in this, his front lawn so the neighbors could come and go by. I think this is the time and one of the slides before we had how uh, creativity actually uh, comes up in moments like that when you have to create alternative ways of doing things. But it is important not to let those things go. Even if you have something, a small ceremony, it's already important. I know that uh, many parents are tired because everything is online. Now you participate in many virtual meetings and virtual events, but you can create events that are not virtual, that are basically in your home. Two ideas that we have to share with you today um, are ideas that we are actually, I'm currently doing that with a number of uh, students and districts. One of them are families using a family journal. Each one in the family, the parents included, you get a journal. And at the end of the day, you have a moment like before going to bed where you write something in the journal. And then you exchange that with someone else in the family. You say, okay, today the journal is going to go to Tracy. So she's going to read the journal read what I wrote and it's so personal, right? How, you know, it could be about my feelings. It could be about what I accomplished during the day. It could be about the things that I'm missing, the things that I'm looking forward to. And then you respond to each other in writing and it becomes kind of a different way of communicating with your kids because many times we know that kids don't usually verbalize orally how they feel or what they feel, but sometimes writing can be a great outlet for them to do so because depending on their age, it could be a, a piece of writing, it could be even uh, something that they draw that you can talk about, use that picture as a way of you know, uh, conveying meaning. Uh, and the other idea that we have is the gratitude box. There's a lot going on and sometimes we forget to, to we, we just look at the negative, we have to turn and try to look at the positive. The gratitude box, I like to use sentence starters. So like this one you have in the picture, it says, I'm grateful for, right? And you can do it once a week if you want. The frequency with which you do it, it really depends on your family, right? But it's important to have a moment, like you have a box, you write what you're grateful for during the week. At the end of the week, you sit down together in the family meeting that we talked about before, and you can open the box and talk about what are the good things that we're doing, despite the, 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 the obstacles, despite the hardship, what is it that it's positive? What are we grateful for? What have we accomplished as a family? How are we learning about each other? So this could be two activities that actually help you. Uh, it's all about connecting. And I think right now, I see that from students, I see that from friends, from families, we all realize how much we need to connect. And those are little activities that can have a huge impact in fostering those kind of connections, especially for children that sometimes are not always able to verbalize their feelings and their thoughts. I think that's a great point. I remember working with someone who um, their family used a gratitude box and I think after using it for a while, they did away with it. And um, 
one of the daughters said, can we please bring the gratitude box back? Because <laughs> I love hearing from my family what I'm doing right. I feel like a lot of times, you know, we're, we're quick to talk about like what we need to improve on or, or what, what our children need to improve on. Um, but this gratitude box, I think, is a great way to um, like just saying thank you for little things that they did or acknowledging little things they did that maybe you didn't mention to them, but that means so much to them. So I'm gl so glad you mentioned that. Okay, so exercise and wellness. So we could talk a little bit about technology. Um, first, we'll talk about Cosmic Kids. There is an app for this, but I highly recommend subscribing to the YouTube channel. This is an age-appropriate um, yoga channel for kids hosted by this fun woman named Jamie, and she does her yoga in all these virtual places, and um, kids find it engaging and fun. Um, I mentioned before, Go Noodle. Uh, not only is it great just for exercise and wind down, it, it, has, um, it has a mindfulness section. So your kids can use it to become more mindful. And it's also like age appropriate. So it's not gonna be a 20 minute meditation, maybe for an adult. It'll be like, you know, three, four or five minutes, which is great. Um, the other app I wanted to mention is Headspace. I love this app. I actually use the Sleepcast. Um, if I have a difficult time falling back to sleep, um, usually 90% of the time I put a sleep cast on and I'll fall back to sleep, whereas other times it doesn't always work. Um, this app is pricey. I want to say it's like $69.99, but some employers through their employee benefits are offering uh, the app for free to their employees. So you might want to check with um, your employer if maybe you could get it for free, but you could always use the limited version. There are still lots of great things on there and there are things for kids on there as well. So I think it's really helpful. Um, as Dr. Nadich said, of course, spend time with your kids, have talks with them, reach out to them, see how they're feeling and what's going on, check in. Um, and also, if your kid is having a hard time coping, be sure you reach out to the school counselor. Generally, every district has at least one school counselor. So you can send them an email, get in touch with them. Um, I know a lot of uh, school counselors are doing Google Meets with kids, sometimes on a weekly basis. Um, and these are just great little things to help them cope. And they're getting um, attention from an adult who cares about them. And um, you know, sometimes they might want to tell someone other than their parents, because when we're uh, quarantining at home, we're not really seeing very many other adults. I mean, unless maybe they call an aunt or they're a grandparent or something, it's hard for them. So, so I think the school counselor is great uh, to uh, connect with. The other thing I wanted to mention, that kids are, since kids are spending a lot of time on devices, they have eye strain. This also, we grownups, as, us grownups as well. Um, the blue light glasses are actually helpful. There's been some mixed reviews on whether or not they work. Um, my friend got them for her son who's five and who is homeschooling. And he said, wow, mama, <laughs> he said, I can finally see because I guess the eye strain was really bothering him. He ended up getting the blue light glasses. They're about $20. You can look them up on Amazon. I think they're really helpful. Dr. Nadich, did you have anything? I for just want to that to the, the library that we mentioned before. Oh, right. I, I live in New York and I've been helping out here in my community because we have a lot of public housing and people who do not necessarily have access to a bunch of resources. So in the high school where I'm helping out right now, uh, one of the things that we organize, and you have to check out and see if your community does that, but in New York, the libraries are great resources. Uh, call your local library because some of them in New York now have a homework helpline to help kids if they don't have help at home or if the parents sometimes do not speak English. So there are a lot of resources. Comcast in New York is providing internet access for two or three months. Uh, I just think it's, if you have issues, for example, sometimes you don't have, something is not working at home, all the districts should be providing you also with educational packets, right? Which is basically worksheets for you to do with your kids at home. So if you don't have that, or if you need extra materials, reach out to the district and ask 
for your educational packet. This is something, some kind of, uh, just like uh, Tracy mentioned, you know, reaching out to the school counselor, reach out to the communication person in your district, in your library. There are a lot of community resources now that sometimes we don't even realize. And it's really great to have, I know that we keep, you know, we were talking about before how much screen time is too much. So I like the idea of the educational packets because it also gives the kids a break from the computer, which we all need, right? So make sure you reach out to your community resources, find out what they are, particularly the local library and the school district itself. Okay. To finish up with the exercise and wellness, one of the most important things is connecting with nature. Um, research shows that being outside actually helps decrease anxiety and depression. So of course, for ourselves, as well as our children, it's really important to get outside, whether now that they open the parks, hopefully you can get to a park, um, or even if you just take a walk in the neighborhood. Um, the other thing too is have uh, talk to your kids about um, expressing themselves. All our kids express themselves in different ways. It was interesting when this whole started, I said to my girls, I'm like, hey, why don't you start journaling? This is an unprecedented time. It might be good for you to keep a journal about your thoughts and your feelings about the situation. But no, they didn't. But what I realized is my daughter who loves art created this beautiful art piece, which talked about how she was feeling. Um, the happiness that she felt that she didn't have to go to school every day, but how sad she felt uh, that she missed her friend. So Pay attention to how your kids want to express themselves, whether it's through journaling, art, it might be music, and it might be physical activity or some other means. Um, but I think that's it's really important for kids during this time. Um, and of course, connecting with their friends. Um, my one daughter is an introvert and she's happy as a lark in the basement. <laughs> and my other daughter um, is really craving uh, seeing her friends. So I think it might be helpful if you could set up a virtual lunchtime. I recommend no more than four children because then I think it gets to be a little too hectic, but you can have, you know, depending on your kid's age, you can either make lunch for them or have them make their own lunch. And then they can have like a set um, meeting, a virtual meeting time and they can, it's like sitting at the lunch table. So they can, I recommend using Messenger Kids or Google Meets, um, or if it's one child, maybe FaceTime if you both have iOS. Um, you can use Zoom, but I think that's better um, if you use that with uh, parental guidance. But I I have seen this virtual lunchtime, and it's it's helpful. And not only that, if if your kids are younger and they can sit there for you know 40 minutes and eat their lunch with their friends, then you get to have that time for yourself, which I think is important as well. Dr. Nadich, did you have anything? No, I, in the next one we talk okay. about. Okay. Okay, so I'll just chat about this and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Nadich. Um, Dr. Nadich said before about Common Sense Media, and this is a great website because um, they everything is, uh, they look at it to make sure the content is is good, it's age appropriate, it's it's appropriate for your kids. So, but not, not only do they have tips on parental controls and safety tips, but they also have great podcasts for kids. So. Maybe your kid's not a big reader, but they like to listen. They'll listen to a podcast. Here's a reminder for Mrs. Kid. Sorry about that. Google Home. Um, they have great podcasts and book reviews. So, you know, you can trust that any of the podcasts on there, um, they'll be able, you could download them for your kids. PBS is great too, not the PBS Kids website, but just the regular P PBS site. It has some uh, guidance that Dr. Nadich and I will chat about on the next slide. And the cult of pedagogy is really, um, it started by a teacher, a veteran teacher, and it talks about all different elements of pedagogy. If, if you really feel hardcore and you want to check that out, you can, but not, obviously not necessary. I'll go to the next slide. Okay, Dr. Nadich. Well, one of the things that we've noticed is that uh, parents uh, are reluctant sometimes to talk about what's going on. And uh, one of the things that I think it's extremely important is that we, we need to talk to kids about what's going on. They need to understand what a pandemic is. And that alone already tells you that suddenly we have our vocabulary has changed because we talk about words that we didn't talk about before. 
So I've been working with a number of school districts and this is a resource that we are going to make available to you. This is a book that was published initially in the UK. This is the American version published in Massachusetts. And uh, basically what it is, it's a child appropriate book about coronavirus and the COVID-19. One of the things that I highly encourage you to do is to engage your child in conversation. I made a quick list of some words. Um, I have actually used the book with a number of districts and I've been training teachers to use it. It's been very positive. Words like PPE, right, which is an acronym, antibody, virus, social distancing. These are all uh, new words. The three T's, right? Test, trace, and treat. These are all new words in our vocabulary. Kids hear them, they know about them, but they don't understand sometimes what it means, right? So if you have a hard time engaging in the conversation, a child book like this one can help you. Talk to your child about what's going on, talking about why it's important, why are we sheltering in place, all of these terms that kids didn't even, and still many of them don't understand. And I can tell this is a phenomenal resource. I have also used resource for uh, Time, Time Magazine, Time for Kids. They also have additional resources that will help you talk to children about what's going on and go over the vocabulary because now these are words that are going to stay with us for at least another year if we want to be realistic. So if you don't talk about that, kids have questions. As I said before, when, we, when I tried that out with a number of school districts, it was very positive because the teachers were using the book because a lot of the parents did not want to engage in the conversation because they didn't know how to approach it. So if that's your case, you can use a book like this one that we're gonna make available to you. And you can also use Time for Kids. They have a lot of resources about talking about what's going on in the world. I think that's a great point. And also, um, you could search it on the web and you could download the book, but we also have a handout with the link for this bo book to download um, that we'll be sharing with you. Um, the other thing too is PBS also offers some videos for younger kids. They're a little bit um, shorter and um, they also have some for older kids too. So they could also watch a video in addition to that. So I just wanted to say thank you all. I was just wondering if anyone had a question for either myself or Dr. Nadich. Doctor, I have a question actually. So you talked earlier about limiting screen time. Um, so for example, a 10 year old who may be in class in session for a four hour period um, in the morning, um, taking a, then taking a break for lunch, um, who wishes to then you know, play video games or, or even like Prodigy, et cetera. Um, what would you think is the, the limit on, on time uh, on you know more screen time is it like a two hour period what, what would be your professional opinion there well, my, from what i've seen so far if the child already spends as you mentioned four hours doing work i Correct. would say that two additional hours is more than enough more than six hours honestly i don't think it's actually good for their health honestly speaking i think it's important okay. to and this is why i suggested before that these things be negotiated you say, okay, so you have four hours that you are doing schoolwork. I'm going to give you two additional hours for you to do work that's chosen by you. Remember, need uh, precedes one. So the need comes with the four hours. The two hours is what they want to do. And then you have to negotiate something else. Okay, so this is where I think it's important to have kids involved in chores, things to mm -hmm. do around the house. If you live in an area where it's hard to go out, so they, so they can move and they can do other things. I think it's important to make it clear in the conversation with the kids. This is the maximum amount of time. Because I, I, apart from that, I'm assuming that a lot of kids also want to watch some TV. They want to be on Netflix, watching other things. So if the computer time is limited to six hours for a 10-year-old, I think that's plenty. Great, thank you. I don't know, Trace, if you agree with me, but I think that's very reasonable. I agree. I try to practice that with my own kids. I mean, I, and honestly, like I'm a parent, just like the rest of everyone here. Um, 
it, it's really hard to navigate. I do my best to do what Dr. Nadich says. I try to limit their screen time, but like sometimes, like I, you know, I'm also a student, so I'd be working on a paper, and sometimes I, I would be caught up in what I was doing, and they'd be on a device for four hours, and I just have to cut myself a break. But I try to be mindful of that and try to just, you know, make sure that there's a, a limit and whatnot. So no, I, I completely agree. And I'm just going to add to that that I think, uh, and I think all of you understand that that it's very important to keep a routine, right? Even for ourselves, right? I have my own routine, the time that I get up in the morning, the time I go to bed, when I do my work, when I have my meetings with my colleagues in my department or at the university. Keeping that routine, I think also helps kids to understand that, okay, so I'm going to have my four hours of computer at this time slot, and then I'm going to give my two hours at that time slot. So they already know that after a certain time, okay, so now what's in that slot? Okay, this is the time where I'm going to do my chores, where I'm going to exercise. I think the more you stay, I know it's difficult sometimes, and you don't have to be super strict, but the more you adhere to a routine, I think the better off you are. Because remember, it's, uh, we are already insane with the amount of information we've been getting from media, from everywhere. So we, uh, I think part of our jobs as educators and parents is to create possibility for sanity right now. What can make us more sane instead of every the craziness that's going out around us? I think that's such a great point. We are really inundated with news and information. So I, I think that's really, and I think, I think, you know, people in general are just kind of quick to not dismiss that, but not realize that they're so overtaken. I think myself, when I was watching the governor, every single day, all of a sudden I realized I needed to stop that because it was really, um, you know, even though I wanted to know what was going on, it was a little defeating after a while. So I knew that I needed to take a break from that. So I think that's a great point. Absolutely. Did anybody else have any questions? Okay, what, I know. What, what comments, anything that, anything that okay. you guys have been doing that you'd like to share with us? Okay, well, I guess uh, we'll end the meeting for now. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate having Dr. Nadich here, Joe, and um, all of the participants, and Karen's still here, that's great. Um, We'll be reaching out to you with the handout and also the recording. So if you have any questions, feel free to either reach out to uh, myself, Dr. Nadich, um, or Joe at the ADP Center, and we'll be more than happy to you know, assist in any way that we can. So thanks so much all for coming. Thank you. Good luck with your homeschooling. <laughs> have a great summer. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.